My name is Chloe Berkowitz, and this is my Polygen's journey. I've always been interested in the topic of climate change, but climate change is a huge issue that needs big solutions. So I was thinking, how could I, just one person, make any sort of difference? Polygence has taken me from not knowing what I could do to impact climate change to developing an experiment that could make an eventual impact to creating an idea that is about to make an immediate impact on the climate crisis. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about the experiment, but rather my journey. And I'm hoping that this might inspire you. So my journey has been about going around Roblox. And this all started last year when a UCLA professor spoke at my school about a new type of cement that he and his team had invented. And what he did was break down the big issue of climate change into smaller issues. And he started with the fact that climate change is mainly caused by greenhouse gas emissions. And of those greenhouse gas emissions, 80% are carbon dioxide. And of those carbon dioxide emissions, 16% of the emissions are from industry. And of those industry and manufacturing um, processes emissions, 19% are from cement manufacturing. So he invented a new way to make cement, which cut its emissions in half. And what stuck with me from this was how he took a big issue, climate change, and drilled it down to a smaller, more manageable problem, cement manufacturing. And now he's created a solution that is having a big impact. So when I came to Polygents, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But my mentor had me do a lot of research on climate change, and I drilled that information down to create an experiment that would test a way to lower the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere can be lowered in two ways, either by reducing the amount of carbon that's being emitted into the atmosphere or increasing the amount of carbon that's being taken out of the atmosphere or sequestering that carbon. I chose to go with carbon sequestration, specifically biological carbon sequestration. 25% of our carbon emissions have been captured by Earth's forest, farms, trees, grasslands, and plants. And trees and plants do this through the process of photosynthesis. They take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they make it into glucose, which makes them grow. So if you apply this to gardens, there are where there are a lot of plants in one place. So how can that garden capture as much CO2 as possible? Well, you would pick the plants that have the highest rate of carbon sequestration. So I live in Los Angeles and most people will buy plants native to Los Angeles. And native plants will have different rates of carbon sequestration. So they could pick the native plants with a high carbon sequestration rate. But why stop there? What about the non-local plants? Some places have the same climate ecosystem as Los Angeles. For example, the Mediterranean, like Italy or Japan. So you can grow those plants from Japan or Italy here in Los Angeles. So the most effective garden to capture the most CO2 would include both native and non-native plants with the highest sequestration rates. A garden made up of super plants would be the best garden to lower a person or household's carbon footprint. So here's the question. Would the rate of sequestration by non-native plants change at all if grown under native conditions? Or would this rate of sequestration of an Italian plant change if it was grown in Los Angeles? So that would be under Los Angeles, um, in Los Angeles air, Los Angeles water, light, and soil. So my experiment was going to be, I would first get seeds of native plants with a high carbon sequestration rate and of non-native plants from Italy and Japan with an even higher carbon sequestration rate. Then I would grow them in my garden here in Los Angeles and then measure the carbon captured in the plants and in the soil. From there, I would see if the native condition affects the sequestration rate of a non-native plant and then see which ends up with the highest carbon sequestration rate. 
and possibly I would create the most efficient garden to lower a household's carbon footprint. Roadblock. I wasn't gonna have time to grow all of these plants. That was gonna take months and sometimes years to get anywhere with a plant. And I also didn't have the equipment or the ability to measure carbon in the soil. And there's a lot of human error in gardening because I'm not a gardener, so maybe I don't do it right. So I had an idea. I had to shorten the process. I went to a nursery to buy a variety of plants that were already grown under the same LA conditions, air, water, light, and soil. When I was at the nursery, I would talk to the gardeners and I asked them for the native and non-native plants that took in the most carbon that were fast growing, perennial, and leafy. And they knew all about these plants. They knew where to find them. And they asked me, well, why these plants? And I said, well, do you know about lowering your individual carbon footprint? And they said, yes. And I said, these are the plants that will lower a person's carbon footprint. And they said, oh, but let's put a pin in that. When I did the actual experiment, I did it at a college lab. I dried the plants in a high-end drying oven, and then I weighed those dried plants in a high-end scale. Then I went outside to burn the plants, and I went back into the lab to weigh those ashes. To determine the amount of carbon captured by each plant, I, dried the, I took the dry weight of the plant, and then from that, subtracted the ash weight of the plant. And that equals how much plant that carbon, uh, how much carbon that plant captured. Roadblock. My results didn't show a significant difference between native and non-native plants. They also didn't show a significant difference between the highest, the highest sequestering plants and the other plants. I just didn't have the equipment to get this data. So was this the end of my experiment? But let's, let's go back to that conversation with the gardeners. They knew about native and non-native plants that were fast growing, perennial, leafy, and they knew about lowering your carbon footprint, but they didn't put that together. So if they weren't putting it together, neither were consumers. So this is where I came up, I started to come up with a marketing idea. And this marketing idea would have to guide consumers who are interested in lowering their carbon footprint to certain plants in the nursery that would help them do this. Um, they'd want to find the, the plants with the highest carbon sequestration rates, whether they were native or not. So instead of the concept of just comparing sequestration rates in native versus non-native plants, now I'm just trying to show the show the consumer the plants with the highest sequestration rates in that nursery. So I went back to the nursery and talked to the gardeners and the managers and I pitched them my idea. And the idea was for stickers to put on a plant's pot to indicate to the consumer that that would be a good plant or one of the best plants to lower their carbon footprint. And think of this sticker as sort of a carbon footprint seal of approval like the Energy Star seal of approval that goes on appliances. Like, and that would indicate that that appliance uses less energy. So getting into some of my designs, I started with the common symbol of just a green footprint. This says carbon footprint. This is what comes up when you search it on Google and it's, you see it a lot. And if not a footprint, a boot print says the same thing. But what these don't say is how to lo is lowering your carbon footprint. So this design has a fade from black to green to show progress, or it could be a, uh, two footprints um, or a series of footprints showing this black to green to just show a progress in improving your carbon footprint. Or for a less literal direction, I could have a sticker that has a number rating on it and that will like rate how good that plant is at sequestering carbon. But I don't really have the tools for such an exact number. And this turns customers away from plants with lower ratings. 
Another idea would be a little more fun with it has a picture of an okay, hands, uh, okay symbol. And this is like inspired by the emoji okay symbol. Or I could make a design for a specific company. Um, this is an example from Pike Nurseries or Armstrong Garden Centers, which is where I bought my plants. And this one mirrors their existing brand slash logo with the colors of it. So I brought this idea to Armstrong Nurseries and I met with the division head of marketing and they really liked it. And I have a meeting set up with the head of the marketing department of the whole national company. But while I was waiting on that meeting, I called up the largest grower in California. And nurseries don't actually grow their own plants. They're supplied by growers, which are like super nurseries. So this grower supplies, it's much larger than Armstrong. It supplies Armstrong and many other national nurseries and nurseries across the state. And when I talked to this grower, he told me that he really liked the idea, but he said, you're just a high school kid and I'm a businessman. So I'm gonna need someone to verify those facts and ideas. And as a suggestion, he told me about um, an article that he had read in a prestigious journal called Flora. And this article was about carbon sequestration. And he said, this was written by an expert. So you need to get an expert and come back to me. So roadblock. But I called up that expert. Robin Cobley is an expert on plants, an author of many books, and the executive director of her own native plant nonprofit. So I asked her if my idea was valid. And she said yes, she loved the idea, and she wanted to be the expert to back me on this project. So now I'm partnering with her organization, the Summer Tree Institute, who is going to take this around with me to the growers and nurseries in California to sell the idea. Now consumers all over the state will be, guarded, will be guided by my carbon footprint sticker. This whole process started as, well, I wanted to make an impact on climate change. And I started with a science experiment, but that didn't work out. So, but from there, I came up with a marketing idea, which is now allowing me to make a small but immediate impact on climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. It's such a no. It's such a good lesson, I think, for all of us that I mean, when you, especially when you take such a large, seemingly uh, insurmountable problem and break it down, we can all do something to yeah. to achieve that. Um, the the story you told in the beginning about the professor was so so great for that. Um, quick question: So, I mean, where do you go from here? Like, what what's your next step? So now I'm working with this organization and we're going to make, um, with this expert, I'm going to make a list of the plants that are the highest sequestering and we'd be best to lower an individual's carbon footprint. And I'm gonna take that list to the grower um, mm -hmm. that I talked to and other growers. And that's gonna be, those are gonna be the plants that have the labels. And then I'm gonna decide on a final design with those growers and nurseries for that label. But that's where I'm at right now. Very cool. And then one more question. Uh, what do the folks in the audience do to support your idea? Um, well, when it's out there, you can buy the plants that have the stickers. Um, but also it's, my idea is sort of, um, about a greater concept of just changing your mindset. Start thinking about um, every little thing you can do to help. Because like I said, it's a really overwhelming issue. So you have to think about just taking it one step at a time. So um, find ways that you can take action in that way. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you.